Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this FTB webinar on the role and relevance of climate change in planning decisions. My name is Harry Wood Philpott, and I'll be presenting this webinar jointly with Ned Westaway, uh, uh, whose name you'll see appears in many of the cases that we will be uh, discussing uh, this afternoon. So far as the format is concerned, I will start with a presentation on um, the statutory and policy context, and then specifically on cases concerning uh, the use of fossil fuels and how that is treated in decision making. Ned will then deal with cases uh, concerning the extraction of uh, fossil fuels and we will finish with a short question and answer session. Now, um, there is a question and answer function on Zoom. And uh, if you submit your questions, please, by um, using that button, we will uh, seek to deal with uh, some of those questions. At the end, we'll inevitably have to be selective but we'll try and deal with uh, as many as we reasonably can. Um, and uh, when all this is finished, uh, there will be uh, an email sent out to all of you with both a copy of the slides and also a link to a recording uh, of the presentations. So I start with um, applications relating to uh, the use of fossil fuels. And I thought it was worth starting with some basic uh, propositions to set the context. First of all, there doesn't seem to be um, any doubt that the impact that a use would have on climate change is capable of being a planning uh, consideration. Secondly, whether or not it's material in any case will depend on the circumstances of that case. But thirdly, there are circumstances in which it is a mandatory consideration, and that will be set by legislation in some cases and also by policy, especially for larger projects, and we'll be looking at some of those matters in due course. But a key issue in the focus of the talk is whether and if so how the carbon emissions from a particular project could be said to justify the refusal of planning permission. Starting then with a bit of legislative uh, context, for policy making, legislation makes climate change a key consideration. Under the Town and Country Planning Act uh, and the system of development control that that uh, is concerned with, section 19 of the PCPA imposes a duty on local planning authorities to include in their local plans policies designed to secure that the development and use of land contribute to the mitigation of an adaptation to climate change. Under the Planning Act 2008, so dealing here with the, the major infrastructure proposals, there is a statutory duty to take account of government policy on climate change and mitigating and adapting to climate change when making or reviewing national policy statements. And then under the uh, Climate Change Act itself, there's a duty to assess uh, risks to the UK from climate change, to set climate change adaptation objectives and proposals and policies for meeting those objectives. And um, the NPPG on climate change says that uh, the risk assessment and na national adaptation program uh, report may provide helpful information for plan making, but doesn't indicate that that would be helpful for decision taking. Next, under legislative context, uh, one needs to consider how this then permeates down to uh, decision making. And one has on the one hand, those statutory provisions that put either the development plan uh, or national policy statements in the case of the Planning Act 2008, at the heart of decision making, giving practical effect to those policy making requirements. But also, separately to that, there are the environmental information uh, assessment regulations, and they oblige the decision maker 
to have regard to the climate change impacts of individual EIA developments. Now I've identified the key provisions on the slide here, but in short, where there are likely significant effects uh, on climate, those need to be assessed and then reported in the environmental statement. And that information, of course, has to be considered by the decision maker when deciding whether to grant planning permission um, for uh, or, or a development consent order. Now, in practice, it, it's very far from straightforward to assess the significance of emissions uh, of any individual project, given the scale of the receptor, the global climate, and the scale of the emissions from any individual development proposal. And so one of the practical ways in which this has been done is to measure the individual um, proposals emissions by reference to uh, the UK's ability to meet uh, the budget that it has set for itself and that's a common approach taken. So then turn to the policy context and uh, for the, so far as the town and country planning system is concerned, there are two main sources of policy, development plan and the MPPF. And the policies in the development plan should be designed to help tackle climate change. But that, of course, has its limits. Um, principally, because it has to align, those policies have to align with the MPPF itself. And that includes, in particular, planning to meet assessed needs for housing and economic growth. The MPPF itself sets three overarching objectives and they include the uh, environmental objective that in turn includes mitigating and adapting to climate change including moving to a low carbon economy but it's made clear that those are not those objectives are not criteria against which to judge individual proposals section 14 of the MPPF, uh, meeting the challenge of climate change, focuses on shaping places to sus uh, support sustainable patterns of movement, which helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But that's all in the context of planning to meet identified needs. And read as a whole, uh, it it's fair to say that the MPPF does not provide uh, support for a decision not to meet identified needs because of the effect that that would have on greenhouse gas emissions and that's reflected also in the MPPG on climate change which is mainly focused on plan making and the guidance is not aimed at using the contribution of an individual project to climate change as a reason for refusal. So then I turn to the policy context under the Planning Act 2008, and, and I've just taken some uh, examples over the next few slides of how climate change is treated in national policy statements for some of the biggest developments and those that would be expected to generate the most greenhouse gas uh, emissions when in use. And though these policy statements are spread over the past decade and they do represent some evolution of approach and the first that I put up on the slide here are the energy uh, MPSs, the suite of um, energy MPSs and they were conceived and designated at the start of the last decade against the context of the previous target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and they cover all different types of energy generation project including uh, energy generation based on the use of fossil fuels there is no test of acceptability of such proposals based on greenhouse gas emissions. And there is explicit provision, which I've identified in the bullet point there, that greenhouse gas emissions are not a reason to prohibit uh, the consenting of projects. So they're not a potential reason for refusal in and of themselves, and that there is no need to assess individual applications against carbon budgets. And uh, this, uh, this policy approach has been the focus of judicial analysis recently in the Drax case, which I'll be coming to in due course. Second uh, national policy statement that I've identified is the National Networks MPS, so dealing with um, road and rail projects. 
and there's some evolution one can see uh, uh, over the uh, intervening years projects are now expected uh, under this NPS to assess their carbon impact in the context of the government's targets and its budgets but it's very like unlikely that these would be uh, affected and I've given a recent example there in the um, final bullet point of this policy in practice. So climate issues there treated in the decision letter as being important and relevant, but because the environmental impact assessment showed that there would be no significant impact from that particular project, it didn't ultimately affect the decision whether or not to grant the DCO. And that's always likely to be the case for individual projects, even road projects, which is perhaps why challengers are now looking more uh, often at the wider policy making decisions as a target for legal challenges. Uh, and an example of that is recent pre action protocol correspondence uh, threatening judicial review of the Department for Transport's Road Investment Study. Two. And then finally in the um, NPSs, we move forward towards the end of the last decade with uh, the airports NPS. And um, one can see again there's, a, there's an evolution in the policy approach now expressly contemplating the possibility that development consent might be refused for an individual project because of its greenhouse gas emissions, but, but only if it would have a material impact on the ability of the government to meet its targets and budgets. Now, even for a use project of the scale of Heathrow Airport expansion, it seems unlikely that that would ultimately lead to refusal of development consent. That's obviously now um, all affected by the ongoing litigation, which I'll um, come back to in due course, uh, about the MPS. But if the Court of Appeals uh, decision in relation to that challenge upholding one of the challenges to the NPS, uh, if that is overturned by the Supreme Court, it would be interesting to see how the, the matter then manifests itself in terms of the examination of any eventual application. Um, but if it is upheld, if the Court of Appeals judgment is upheld, then again, it'll be interesting to see how the government tackles it in any revised airports NPS, whether it's dealing with Heathrow and or other airports. So against that background, I come to consider um, some of the most important recent cases, and I've identified five that I'm going to um, talk about, illustrating how these principles have been tested and explored through the courts. And uh, the fourth and fifth of those are forthcoming cases which um, are currently as I understand at the permission stage and uh, are ones to watch. So I start off with Millstone. Uh, Millstone was an unsuccessful uh, challenge uh, to the Secretary of State's decision not to revoke a development consent order for an energy from waste facility that had been granted in 2017 and this was a facility based in North London. Um, Ned, who you'll be hearing from later, acted for the government in this case, and I'm grateful to him for drawing it to my um, attention. And the claimant invited the Secretary of State to revoke that DCO that had been granted some time ago on the basis, amongst other things, that there had been a change in circumstances in the meantime, and that was the adoption of the net zero target and when the Secretary of State declined to revoke the DCO, there was a challenge on Wednesday grounds, arguing that it was in fact irrational not to regard this change as amounting to exceptional circumstances that would therefore warrant revocation of the development consent order. Now, um, I think the case is ultimately interesting um, not because of any judicial pronouncements, because those are not available, the case was turned down at the um, permission stage, but more because of what can be gleaned from the Secretary of State's summary grounds of defence about the implications of the net zero target for individual development control decisions as seen um, by the government. Uh, and what you see on the screen here, which are extracts from the Summary Grounds of Defence, is subsequently reflected 
in the DRAX uh, decision. And so this is not a document of government policy, but it is a pleading which will have been approved um, by the government's lawyers and will therefore um, be expected to reflect the views of the government on these matters. And the first bullet point uh, presents the point in very clear terms um, that there are no necessary implications for individual development consents of adopting the net zero target. And that um, statement would appear to be applicable in principle just as much to proposals uh, under the Town and Country Planning Act as it is under the Planning Act 2008. And the second um, seeks to explain why that is the case. And I'll just read this out. Crucially, there's nothing in legislation or policy prescribing how that reduction of net emissions is to be achieved in 31 years time. The government has a wide discretion as to the steps it takes across the whole economy to achieve this future national goal. The obligation is programmatic, i.e. it's for the UK to select the means to achieve the objective. The amendments to the Climate Change Act have no necessary implications for existing DCOs. In particular, operation of the energy from waste will not preclude the UK from meeting its 20 50 target and that final sentence encapsulates uh, the challenge that faces those who are seeking to persuade the decision maker in any case to refuse an individual development proposal on the basis of its greenhouse gas emissions would this have any material impact on the ability of the UK government to meet its target and if so how on earth do you go about demonstrating that the next case uh, is the successful challenge to the airport's national um, policy statement. And I'll deal with this relatively briefly because it's been extensively covered elsewhere. And importantly, it concerns policy making rather than development control. But nevertheless, it is being used and by other claimants and prospective claimants to try and challenge a range of decisions both in terms of policy but also in terms of uh, decision making on individual projects but it's important to keep in mind that the court's judgment in that case primarily hinged on two case specific factors the first is that we're making a decision on a new mps as i've explained earlier there is a specific statutory requirement to take account of government policy on climate change. So there's a specific statutory hook. And the decision, secondly, was made in the interim period between the Paris Agreement and the adoption of the net zero target. And it was the government's decision not to take account of the Paris Agreement in that interim period that was fatal rather than any necessary implication of the agreement or the net zero target reflecting it for the expansion of Heathrow and the Court of Appeal was very keen to make that clear and other challenges have sought without success so far to make use of that judgment to attack individual development proposals and for example there was the unsuccessful attempt by Chris Packham uh, the um, TV presenter to um, challenge the government's decision to proceed with HS2 uh, on the back of the Plan B Earth case, uh, a, a challenge which ultimately didn't get anywhere. Next uh, is the Drax case. And uh, this is another of uh, Ned's cases. Um, he was acting for the government uh, alongside Andrew Tate, uh, QC, and um, also from Chambers, we had. Uh, Mark Westman Smith acting for Drax Power, the developer, and uh, Greg Jones and Mero Golden acting for the claimant. So, a bit of a chambers outing. And this was a challenge um, by Client Earth to the decision of the Secretary of State to grant development consent for two gas fired generating units. And these were um, uh, found to have resulted or would result in significant increases in greenhouse gas emissions and there were nine grounds of challenge several of which related to greenhouse gas emissions 
and the net zero target and the implications for decision making. And judgment was handed down um, last week with all uh, grounds being dismissed. And what this case illustrates is the critical distinction between policy making and decision taking when dealing with climate change under the Planning Act 2008. And I'll seek in the next few slides to provide an overview of some of the key grounds, but it is a decision which is worth reading um, in the original uh, and with some care. Before looking at the grounds, just to give you some of the background facts, the, the claimant uh, in the examination stage had persuaded the examining authority that it was appropriate to revisit the issue of need, which had been settled in the national policy statement EN1 for the particular development, taking account of climate change. And it also persuaded the examining authority that there was in fact no need for this development in the light of uh, subsequent developments, that's subsequent to um, the designation of EN1. Secretary of State rejected that recommendation, but also rejected the approach that the examining authority had taken, relying on uh, MPS EN1 as establishing the need case and there being no requirement to go further than that. The Secretary of State nevertheless regarded the net zero target as a matter that's both important and relevant using the um, statutory uh, term under section 104 to the decision on whether to grant consent for the development. Important preliminary points to note from the judgment uh, that ultimately rejected the challenge. First point is that the Secretary uh, 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 State's uh, uh, obligation to address the requirements of the Climate Change Act is a policy making task under the Planning Act 2008. Secondly, that uh, there is a critical role of systems beyond planning control to influence the types of infrastructure coming forward. That's something that's set out in national policy and reflected now in the judgment. Thirdly, and really importantly, Section 1043 of the Planning Act prevents the use of the balancing exercise called for in Section 1047 as a vehicle to challenge the merits of the national policy statement based on um, net zero, uh, the net zero target or, or indeed any other change of circumstance. And importantly also for the energy MPSs, that the um, preclusive or presumptive effect of a national policy statement under section 104 depends on the wording of the policy and also its proper interpretation. Uh, and those are important points in order to set the context for the court's rejection of the individual grounds of challenge. So the first two grounds of challenge concerned the question of need and the approach that had been taken by the Secretary of State and the rejection of the examining authorities approach. And the court rejected both of these grounds as a barely disguised challenge to the merits of the policy on need in the MPS. And it said that the evidence that the claimant had adduced at the examination relating to changes of circumstance since the MPSs were designated uh, and the matter such as the impact of the move to uh, low carbon generation uh, since 2011 could not uh, alter the interpretation of the policy and what it said about need, that being a matter of law. Then ground three was concerned with um, an alleged misinterpretation of what was said in NPS EM1 on the assessment of greenhouse gas emissions. And what the claimant alleged was that the Secretary of State had disregarded greenhouse gas emissions as a material consideration, but that in doing so, the Secretary of State had misinterpreted the um, advice, the policy advice in the national policy statement, which we looked at earlier. But the court found that the Secretary of State did not treat greenhouse gases and the emissions of greenhouse gases from this development as irrelevant or something to which no weight should be given. But what um, 
the MPS does is to make clear that those emissions are not a reason for refusal in and of themselves, and that that is not, as a policy approach, legally objectionable. But that doesn't mean that the policy treats them as irrelevant or a disbenefit to which no weight can be given. So uh, although they're not a reason for refusal in themselves, they're not irrelevant and weight can be given to it. Ground four concerned the uh, allegation that there had been an error in how the Secretary of State had carried out the balancing exercise in section 1047 when dealing with greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And what the court said is that the MPS proceeds on the basis that there's no justification in land use planning terms for treating greenhouse gas emissions as a disbenefit which, which in itself is dispositive of an application for a DCO. Um, and the Secretary of State did consider whether the adverse effect on greenhouse gas emissions should be given greater weight in this case. Um, and the MPS didn't preclude that possibility so long as those emissions were not treated as a freestanding reason for refusal. And because the Secretary of State's approach was consistent with that, ground four was rejected. Ground seven um, was a, a ground that the court um, brought up itself, as I understand it, during the hearing, and the claimant um, sought to amend its pleadings in order to introduce this as an additional ground of challenge. And it was said that in um, unfairness, because the Secretary of State gave the parties no opportunity to make submissions on the implications of the adoption of the net zero target, which had happened after the close of the examination. And the court uh, found uh, that where the uh, decision had um, treated this target as important and relevant, uh, but it, because it didn't alter the policy in the MPS and wasn't incompatible with it because of the range of potential pathways, um, that there was actually no unfairness in preventing the parties, or not giving the parties an opportunity to make submissions on that. And the reason for the court's rejection of that ground of challenge was that when the claimant identified during the course of the proceedings the submissions it would have made if given the opportunity about the implications of the net zero target, the court found that those submissions would have amounted to an impermissible challenge to the merits of the MPS uh, and that that is not uh, allowed, that's impermissible because challenges to the merits of policy are uh, dealt with under the statute and those are representations which can be disregarded and the only vehicle for making uh, submissions about uh, the implications of the net zero target for the merits of policy would be a review of the policy under section 6 of the Act. And then the final um, ground was ground 8 and the allegation of a failure correctly to consider uh, the implications of the net zero target and what the court found here was that the Secretary of State's reliance on other mechanisms outside the planning system such as the electricity market reform or the EU emissions trading scheme were a matter for her judgment and the approach taken to those was consistent with the MPS. So the final matter is to deal with uh, two forthcoming cases. Uh, the first is a judicial review, an application for judicial review related to the energy NPSs. This was the subject of some quite heavily publicised pre-application correspondence between the three claimants and uh, the Secretary of State on the review of uh, the energy NPSs. And in that correspondence, the claimants sought to persuade the Secretary of State that not only um, should she review the energy MPSs, but that it would be irrational in a Wednesbury sense uh, not to do so. And ultimately the Secretary of State in the pre-action protocol uh, correspondence declined to accede to that um, invitation. 
And so an application for permission has been made. And uh, it, it is quite, it's quite an unusual uh, challenge because it's not challenging a positive decision. The Secretary of State's pre-action protocol response has said, well, we're already actively considering whether it's appropriate to review all or parts of the energy MPSs, and that until we've made that decision, it's premature to bring uh, a challenge. But that hasn't um, dissuaded the claimants, and we shall have to see what the court makes of that. Second uh, challenge that's uh, recently been submitted is an application for permission for judicial review by the Mayor of London to challenge by uh, the grant of a development consent, for dissent, development consent order for the Riverside Energy Park. And this is a proposal that includes a large incinerator energy recovery facility. And the, the Mayor of London opposed uh, the scheme through the examination, including on the grounds of the greenhouse gas emissions that would result from its use and their impacts. The proposed grounds of challenge to the decision to approve it are very similar in a number of cases to those pursued in the Drax case, but the challenge was issued before judgment in the Drax case was handed down. The, the mayor's statement of facts and grounds acknowledges that there will be a need to review those grounds once judgment in the Drax case as available is available, and that is now the position. So one um, has to assume that there will be some uh, reconsideration of the grounds. Those weren't the only grounds, but um, it will be interesting to see how they seek to attack the decision in the light of what the court has said in Drax. So just drawing this um, together, I think there are two main themes that emerge from that review of the position. Um, the first is that policy making remains the main focus so far as developments um, concerning the use of uh, fossil fuels are concerned. And there are important statutory provisions that come into play when making policy and the implications of those statutory provisions, which are relatively recent, have yet to be fully explored. And policy making, particularly at the national level, does appear to offer more scope for making a significant difference to greenhouse gas emissions, and also perhaps might be seen as a better fit as a tool for tackling what is a global rather than a local um, issue. The second theme is, is that it is inherently difficult to justify um, refusing planning permission for uh, or development consent order for an individual development proposal on the basis of its greenhouse gas uh, emissions based on the policy position as it stands. Policy um, simply at the moment isn't set up on the whole to support such a course of action. And it's difficult, inherently difficult to show that individual projects will make a difference having regard to the way that the issue is tackled under the Climate Change Act. So those are, um, those are my thoughts on the question of um, use of fossil fuels and how that plays out uh, in decision making. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Ned, who will deal with um, extraction cases. So hopefully Ned will now appear. Yes, indeed he does. And I'll hand over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Harry. I will just get my slides up, which look remarkably similar to Harry's. And while I'm doing that, if I can remind everyone, and I think some people may have joined later, but we're all getting used to Zoom now, that there's a question and answer function at the end. I'll, I will go, I think, until about three o'clock or just after, and then we'll, we'll spend a few minutes taking some questions, um, if, any are, if any are asked. Um, no compulsion to do so. Um, but simply don't be shy to. So do, if, if you've got any questions as we go along, um, do put them down or um, save them to the end if you want to check them. But um, there's a risk if you don't put them down now that we might uh, just miss them. So Harry's covered um, uh, use and I'm going to look at extraction projects. And I think really there 
the two most critical types of planning application involving climate change. Um, and like Harry, I'm going to do that by seeing how the case laws evolved. But I want to start with just a little bit of context as well. Um, I'll then uh, say a couple of things about extraction cases. Uh, I will then look at five cases, four of them high court cases and one a recent planning appeal and that was actually one where Harry acted for the appellant so we're sort of sharing our own experience between us here and then I'll finish with some reflections before we get to um, questions if there are any. So in terms of background thoughts um, I wanted to add something about the relevance of climate change in planning from non-planning sources and there's three points here really. The first is the Climate Change Act Undoubtedly, this was a radical piece of legislation um, and it was made more radical by the 2019 Net Zero Amendment Order last July. But there's been, perhaps surprisingly, limited direct reliance upon it um, in the courts, other than generically as part of material consideration relating to climate change. The Act itself and the reason for this might be because it has a sort of self-contained structure. The three headline points which many of you will be aware of are the 2050 target, now net zero, five-year budgeting, and then the Committee on Climate Change um, providing uh, regular advice. A query whether the climate change is a constitutional statute, as um, might have been said by the late great Sir John Laws um, following his case in Thoburn and Sunderland. His recent passing means we're deprived of his opinion on that point. But the Climate Change Act is, I think, at least what I would call embedded legislation. Changes to targets and budgets once set require, quote, significant changes or significant developments. They can't just be made. And indeed, it was significant changes that justified the, the net zero amendment order. The Act is policed, though, not through any direct statement saying it's material in some context or other, but by reports to Parliament and proposals where there is budget, ex budget excess. And that applies to the 2050 target as it does to the budgeting periods. So um, section 26 says, when the final report's due on the 31st of May 2052, if the target's not been met, the statement from the Minister must explain why it has not been met. Um, so in some senses we have a distinct and self-contained regime. We can see perhaps in the budget 2020 what government's going to do about it. Um, second point is declarations of climate emergency and I would categorize these as potentially relevant. Um, they were about a year ago very in vogue. Scotland nationally led the way followed by Wales, followed by Westminster, followed a little bit later by Northern Ireland and as of um, earlier this year 281 local authorities so the majority of local authorities had declared climate emergencies if you want to find out whether yours has there's a link to a website there. Um, I've also put a reference to a recent decision um, it's just a, a planning decision but quite an interesting one where an inspector single wind turbine application but an inspector found although there was a conflict with the NPPF um, he found a number of circumstances overrode that, including um, reliance he placed upon the fact that North Norfolk District Council had made a declaration of climate emergency. Last background thoughts, and perhaps the most germane to what we're talking about today, is the courts. Um, undeniably, there's been increasing recognition of materiality, or as it's often said, obvious materiality of climate change in the courts. One can see that in the volume of cases. Um, if one does uh, a fairly unscientific, but perhaps illuminating nonetheless, search on Westlaw under the subject matter climate change, just eight challenges relate to a climate change commitment being relied upon, all of them since 2016, and three of them already this year. So there's been a real um, uh, well in climate change cases. I've given a link there to another case that I won't say much about, McLennan, but it's a, it's a small case, perhaps an example of how the small can illuminate the big of domestic solar installation that was going to be shaded 
um, by a domestic extension. Um, and the local planning authority argued that was immaterial. Effectively, Mr Justice Lane said there was unanswerable force in the submission that it was material, could not be ignored, despite the fact that it was a single solar panel. Um, so the courts are treating climate change, even in quite minor contexts, as a mandatory material consideration. Um, the other links there are something I think that might become more relevant, certainly one sees it in other jurisdictions, is a comparative or international element. Um, climate cases aren't, they're not, they're not unique to the United Kingdom or England and Wales. Um, and there's increasingly some level of cross fertilization. The Gloucester Resources case is a fairly recent case from Australia that um, perhaps illustrates the relevance of that to extraction. So, what I'm going to come on and talk about. Briefly, then, policy context for extraction cases. Um, a distinction between extraction and the use cases Harry was talking about is that um, fossil fuel transport storage and combustion for energy, they're all recognised as nationally significant infrastructure projects. Extraction is not, and government thought about including shale gas or major shale gas as a potential NSIP, but decided not to do so. So there's little of direct relevance in EN1 and EN2, the energy policy statements, except perhaps some background support for the need for security of supply. One falls back upon local plans, the national planning policy framework, written ministerial statements and other sources such as the Committee on Climate Change. The MPPF and section 17 is, is the specific section on minerals. That section doesn't say anything directly about climate change. It states that great weight should be given to the benefits of mineral extraction, um, but uh, doesn't say that negative weight should be given to climate change. The only reference to that is possibly footnote 65, which says great weight doesn't apply to coal, obviously motivated, or one would assume motivated by the fact that coal has um, greater impacts. Um, the National Planning Practice Guidance also doesn't refer to climate change um, to any material extent. It, it only references climate change in the context of peat extraction. There are a number of written ministerial statements. Those are variable. There was one a little outdated now from 2015 that was important. Um, in November 2019, Andrea Ledson gave one that made the news that um, ruled out, at least for the time being, new hydraulic fracturing um, projects. That wasn't on climate grounds, that was on seismic um, grounds or seismic risk grounds. So specific policy on climate change relating to the extraction of fossil fuels um, is hard to find um, that in any overarching way. One looks to perhaps local plans or mineral plans and um, climate change reports, climate change commission, committee reports, I mean, and government responses to it. So that brings me on to the cases. And before I talk about the five cases I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, detail today. There's just some overarching issues I wanted to highlight and some of these resonate with the points that Harry was saying in relation to the use cases. So the first one I've listed there, um, the question uh, and really the tension as to what the appropriate level is at which to address climate change. Is it policy or is it decision making? My feeling is given the overarching nature of climate change, it is surely a matter that ought to be addressed strategically, so at policy level. Um, where it's not, it does create real difficulties for decision makers on individual projects um, and can leave them having to make some sort of policy on the hoof. The second point, again, I think it's an, a, a broad point that applies generally to climate change, is the limitations of planning. It's difficult, if not impossible, um, to understand fully when one's looking at an individual project, the implications and impacts in wider society. So one can think of some examples that came up during the DRAX hearing, market mechanisms, how they apply, including the EU emissions trading system, technological developments that are potentially on foot, such as carbon capture and storage, um, 
even in the shorter term, um, an argument can be made, and I understand that Harry made such an argument in the Russell case, that fossil fuels are needed for a transition. Um, for example, fossil fuels might be needed to construct wind turbine parts. Um, it's complicated and I think poses some real challenges to decision makers at individual level. Um, the last point, and this is perhaps a little different from use cases, um, is measuring indirect impacts. Both use and extraction involve direct impacts, of course, and I say direct car, uh, greenhouse gas emission impacts. Um, for uh, an extraction facility, there will be a certain amount of flaring and other activity at the site itself that will be direct climate change impacts. What distinguishes extraction cases are the indirect impacts um, from the pipeline use of the fossil fuels that are extracted. And that um, is challenging and is something where there's, I think it's fair to say, no clear methodology for how they should be assessed. I've given references there to the Town and Country Planning Environmental, Imp Environmental Impact Assessment regulations. And those effectively say that climate change impacts must be included in environmental statements where relevant. And also that indirect, secondary, cumulative, transboundary, long-term, medium-term, short-term, permanent, temporary positive, etc. effects should be included. So indirect effects must be grappled with somehow. And there's a real difficulty, of, I think, as to how far applicants, authorities and objectors can, indeed should go, in, in trying to quantify those indirect impacts. Um, the case law may suggest that the intensity of the assessment is increasing, but I think it's really a point to watch. So moving on to the cases, um, Preston New Road Action Group is the earliest of the cases. I'm taking them in chronological order. Um, this was two sites um, where Lancashire County Council had refused permission for exploratory drilling. It was a fracking site and the most um, the most uh, infamous of those sites, and perhaps the most infamous of the fracking sites, is the Preston New Road site. That's a picture of it, I understand, there. The applicant was the slightly outlandishly named Quadrilla, and the claimants, not to be outdone, there was the action group, and the second claimant was Gazer Frackman, who changed his name by deed poll for the challenge itself. There's two points of interest here. The first doesn't relate directly to the challenge. Um, it's the approach though, that the inspector and the secretary of state who agreed with the inspector took. The inspector said, and I've quoted it there, that the issues raised as to how shale gas relates to obligations in the Paris Agreement and the IPCC budgets are a matter of future national policy, not for these appeals. So effectively leaving it off to policy development. Um, the case itself wasn't of enormous um, carbon emissions and one can perhaps see uh, the common sense of that approach. The second point um, relates to, this, to the ground that was run by Mr Frackman. And Mr. Frackman's argument was that the environmental statement was defective as it omitted the impact of greenhouse gas emissions from the period of extended flow testing. So there was going to be a period of, I think, some three years after the exploration where there'd be flow testing and the, the gas would be linked in effectively to the grid network. And that wasn't assessed in the environmental statement. Mr. Justice Dove um, said that it's a sensible, indeed a perfectly sensible assumption, and one um, that the court or indeed any other decision maker would come to. He said that um, any gas provided to the grid during the extended flow phase will simply replace gas that would otherwise be consumed by residential and industrial users supplied at the grid. Um, the position was he, he, he thought analogous to an earlier case where a similar point was made by Mr. Justice Lang, Frack Free Rydale, and Mr. Justice Dove's approach was upheld by the Court of Appeal as plainly correct. 
those two cases, Frack Free Rydale and Preston New Road, therefore establish, at least for cases involving limited development of gas, a market substitution principle, i.e. there's no need specifically to assess that pipeline impact. You can reasonably assume, a decision maker can reasonably assume it would make no difference. Next case, um, H.J. Banks. Um, now this is an altogether more permanent and significant fossil fuel development, three million tonnes of coal at Highthorn at Druridge Bay in Northumberland. And you can get a sense of the scale of it and the nature of the location there. That also, I think, um, gives a sense of why it was very controversial. It's near um, a beach on the coast, it's near a bird reserve, it's near settlements. Northumberland County Council resolved to grant permission but the case was called in um, by the Secretary of State and went to an inquiry. The inspector identified greenhouse gas emissions as a main issue, but he concluded that there was, in this case, on the facts before him, a demand for coal and a need for it, even if a narrowing need. He also concluded that if coal was transported by ship and the evidence was that if the coal didn't come from here, it would come um, from somewhere else abroad, that it would be likely to result in overall higher carbon emissions than using indigenous coal. He didn't appear to attach a great deal of weight to that because he said there was some uncertainty about that assumption. And he said that greenhouse gas emissions should be given considerable weight in the planning balance, a considerable negative weight. Um, but overall thought that permission should be granted. The Secretary of State disagreed. And the Secretary of State said um, two things of interest. First, that, that the proposal, despite the fact that um, no particular policy of the MPPF was identified that was breached, that the proposal would not be compliant with the MPPF quotes as a whole. And secondly, going a little further than the inspector, that very considerable weight should be given to the greenhouse gas emissions. This was, for those who remember, the, one of the first decisions of Sajid Javid when he was community secretary, and it's um, a little odd what he said about the MPPF. Um, Harry reminded me when we were preparing for this of the famous scene in the Australian comedy film, The Castle, about a family fighting compulsory purchase order of their land to make way for airport expansion. They end up in court and their hapless lawyer um, argues that the order would be in breach of the Australian constitution. The judge asks him to identify the provision of the constitution it would be in, bre it would be in breach of. And then after an awkward silence and flapping through his papers, the lawyer says, and I won't do the Australian accent, there is no one section it's just the vibe of the thing. So um, that uh, decision disagreeing with the inspector of the Secretary of State went to court and it was effectively a reasons challenge that was brought by the coal mine operator. Um, it was common ground for the purposes of the claim at least that greenhouse gas emissions were capable of being a material consideration. And I would say that was a, a, a right concession um, Mr. Justice Oosley, though, reasoned that having accepted a need, a specific need for the coal, the Secretary of State had to explain how a proposal that was needed for the country's energy could be refused on the basis of adverse impact of greenhouse gas emissions unless the gap was filled by renewables or low carbon sources. And those steps in reasoning had not been completed by the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State couldn't rely upon these, the uncertainty around transportation of coal from abroad. So the decision is quashed and it's gone back, I understand, for redetermination. Um, I don't know whether that's come out yet, but I know it's expected, so if it's not already being issued and I haven't spotted it, then that's due shortly and we'll see what decision the Secretary of State makes, the new Secretary of State. What the case does illustrate, however, is the difficulty for an individual decision maker to be making those wider 
questions and judgment about how gaps might be filled societally by other sources when they're looking at an individual project. Um, and also, frankly, the scrutiny of the court um, as to the assumptions that are relied upon. Next case, um, Stevenson. Um, I don't have uh, a fancy copy of the MPPF, so I've included also a plane there. And th the reason for that is because I think there are some similarities between Stevenson and the Plan B case in the Court of Appeal about Heathrow. The similarity, in short, is that both are procedural challenges to policy relating to climate change, and both, in my view, are fairly limited to their own specific procedural facts. So I'll skip through this one quickly. Um, the challenge was to provision at para 209A of the 2018 MPPF, and that was effectively to copy and paste, as government admitted, um, to copy and paste the 2015 ministerial policy um, that the benefits of unconventional hydrocarbons, among others, would be recognised. However, it had followed a non-statutory consultation which had asked in entirely open terms whether or not there were any comments on the policy. And talk fracking had provided a detailed policy, um, sorry, a detailed consultation response um, referring to many things that happened since then, such as the Paris Agreement, um, IPCC report, etc. So there were four grounds on which a challenge was brought. It's worth just bearing in mind what they are. The first, failure to have regard to material considerations, including climate change, etc. The second, failure to give effect to policy in the Climate Change Act 2008. So the first two were climate grounds then strategic environmental assessment and unlawful consultation. And it was really on that fourth ground that the challenge was successful. The consultation was unlawful because people undertaking the consultation exercise would have thought that the, there was a question as to the merits of the policy. It wasn't simply being copied and pasted without consideration from former policy. As far as ground one, material considerations, the claim succeeded on that. Mr Justice Dove said the Paris Agreement was obviously material, but it was in that context, so it was in the context of the consultation issue. Ground two is interesting because this was a direct reliance to some extent on the Climate Change Act 2008, and Mr Justice Dove said that was unarguable and didn't give permission for it. Effectively, he said that those targets can be met and are unaffected by the policy, not for the court to say otherwise. He also added, and I've set it out there, that he accepts Mr Warren's submission, it was for the Secretary of State, that in an individual decision, applications, sorry. Ah, okay. in individual decisions on plans or applications, the in principle support for unconventional hydrocarbon extraction provided by that paragraph will have to be considered alongside any objections and evidence produced relating to this to the impact of shale gas extraction on climate change and of course that paragraph's now fallen away following this challenge but what mr Ju mr justice Dove is suggesting is that the kind of wider policy issues as to climate change can be and perhaps need to be considered on individual applications. So there's a tension being set up there. Um, wrestle, this was Harry's um, case, and permission was granted in a decision letter from January, so it's a fairly recent case. There was a three-day inquiry in November 2019. Um, this was um, a application to undertake further development at an existing well site to facilitate the production of oil and gas for a temporary period of 15 years. And the planning authority, in fact, withdrew its case, so the opposition was from third party objectors, many of whom raised climate change arguments. I'll jump straight to the decision letter. Um, I've set out uh, three, I think, important points from it there that are relevant to climate change, but it's a power of 35 that one finds an expression, albeit in local terms, of this market substitution principle that I think it's worth noting. 
the effect would simply be to transfer production to a more local source. The last case I want to mention is one that's not yet been determined and I can update you all that it will not be determined and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but it was a claim that was issued at the end of last year and was granted permission by Mrs Justice Lang in February. It relates to a um, coal mining proposal in Cumbria at Whitehaven and one can see an artist's impression of what modern coal mining looks like there. A key claim that was made by the applicant um, was that coking coal, and this was for the high quality metallurgical coal, would substitute coal imported from the US and Australia, so lead to savings. The officer's report, um, which the committee agreed with, the Cumbria County Council Committee agreed with, said that one weighed up the direct carbon emissions from the development with the savings, and broadly this was carbon neutral. Five challenges were brought, but I've set up four of them there in very, very summary terms. Um, effectively, the challenge was that this didn't properly assess climate change impacts at all. It was far too broad brush, nor did it assess the greenhouse gas emissions from, not from the coking coal, but from the middlings coal, an amount of which would also be excavated as part of this development. It was also said that the development failed properly to consider net zero, and comply with the EIA regulations. Those grounds will not fall to be determined as part of that claim. And the reason for that is, if you were listening carefully, it was a challenge to a resolution. Um, so the council was not, as they say, functus. It did not in fact make the decision. Um, nor was the applicant in a position where it particularly wanted this non-planning permission to be challenged. So the applicant has made a further planning application. Cumbria County Council has confirmed that it will determine that and does not intend to rely upon the former resolution. And it's interesting just to complete the story on Bennett to note some of the terms of that application. It continues to rely upon the same point about greenhouse gas emission savings, so that transportation point. But the planning statement of para 4.2.3 says, and this is referring to net zero, that while compliance with the duty under 2008 Act is a matter for the Secretary of State, the extent to which a development may cause significant additional greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore affect the steps required to ensure compliance with this duty, may still be a relevant material consideration in the determination of a planning application by a local authority. So pausing there, the applicant is inviting the County Council to have regard to the implications of its development on the steps necessary to comply with the Climate Change Act um, target net zero. The statement goes on to say, albeit, the weight given to such a consideration must necessarily reflect the level of uncertainty involved in such judgments, but that doesn't detract from the fact that one finds here an applicant inviting an authority to take that into account, presumably for a very sensible reason, that it wants to avoid the legal risk of a further challenge. Um, so that's the cases I wanted to discuss, and I've just got a, a few reflections, and I see there have been some questions, um, so I'll be a moment only more. First, I think the cases I've discussed show that at least in the area of fossil fuel extraction, there is no clear overarching policy, and that does make decision making more difficult. Second, there's uncertainty as to the extent to which decision makers will, in practice, and perhaps can, enter into the arena of climate change. And when I say that, I mean get involved in the detail of the various wider societal implications of climate change. Linked to that, there's a real challenge of proper assessment um, and proper assumptions. And two that are most commonly referred to are a market substitution. That's one where we've seen the court endorse that a few times. 
but where the courts endorsed it, there's not been considerable evidence against it. And carbon leakage, that's the argument that if, um, say, energy isn't produced in this country, it'll be produced in another country that may have worse standards. So one actually gets a net negative effect. Fourth point, um, it's an open question really. On whom does the burden lie when one's making these assessments of um, indirect impacts and when one's drawing these assumptions? Does it lie upon an applicant just to justify the position? Does it lie upon objectors to justify their concerns? I suspect it's a mixture of the two and each case is going to depend upon its facts. And the final point, um, and this is uh, drawing from some of that comparative jurisprudence, um, as a US case I cite there, but in the US quite a lot of these cases have been linked to environmental impact assessment and um, that term hard look comes from the Montana Environmental Information Center case where it was said um, that there the US Office of Mining had not properly looked at what they'd referred to, indirect and cumulative impacts, they hadn't seriously looked at what they would be. And it seems to me that may be an area where there's some real scope for development of the jurisprudence also in the United Kingdom, um, because we do have provisions within the environmental impact assessment regulations that say that those impacts must be included within um, environmental statements. So that, that's all I had. We get to there. Harry, you're, you're muted. So, yes, I can see that. It's, it, it's just informed me. Um, thank you very much. Uh, excellent stuff. We've had uh, a limited number of questions, but I'm, what I'm going to do, um, the, there's one of those questions from Helen Forbes, which seems to relate directly uh, Ned, to much of the substance of your talk. So I'm going to leave that one till last, give you a chance to look at um, the point that Helen has raised. Uh, and there are two other questions which I'll sort of deal with um, beforehand. And obviously, Ned, if you've got anything to add on those, please chip in. Um, the, the first is from Helen Willows, who um, expresses surprise that there's no concept of a national policy statement being rendered out of date by the adoption of more recent policy on net zero. And that really seems to me to be um, part of the subject matter of the Drax case. And um, aside from obviously just looking at what the court found there, one of the things that I, that I would comment on is you need to understand that conclusion in the context of the Planning Act itself and the system of the Planning Act and what it was intended to address. Before the Planning Act um, was brought about and brought into force, there was a, a gap because policy, national policy, on the need in particular for major infrastructure projects was very haphazard. Uh, there was no real system in place for bringing it about and keeping it up to date. And so uh, a lot of the difficulty that arose with the uh, Heathrow Terminal 5 inquiry arose as a result of the absence of up-to-date government policy on whether that development was needed and if so, how um, you went about assessing its impacts. And so the Planning Act is a direct response to that. And it has, uh, has to be seen as a whole. And you have to look at the provisions that govern policy making and the role of the policy that emerges from um, the, the policy making process in individual decision making, and then the process for challenge. Look at that as a coherent whole. The idea is to provide long-term stability and certainty of the policy position for these developments. And therefore, it's deliberately designed to make it uh, difficult to show that a policy is no longer to be uh, taken at face value when it comes to decision making. So that's not accidental. And it seems to me that the court's um, approach in Drax and in other cases reflects an understanding of that system when seen as a whole. 
And so it's not the same as in some of the um, town and country uh, planning cases where the, the MPPF uh, in, has within its terms the possibility that individual development plans might be rendered out of date. And that's a regular part of the process. That's not how the Planning Act is, is designed to work. And I think that it's important to understand that context in order to see why um, uh, the, the, the court found as it did. Um, now, do you want to add anything on, on that before we move on to um, the next question? I, I'd only endorse that. I think, I, I think that is what underpins what Mr. Justice Holgate found in the Drugs case. It's the provisions for review. There, they sit, and it's slightly unusual in the Planning Act 2008 that you have provisions for review, and review can be requested by members of the public. And there's specific provisions limiting judicial review challenges to decisions to review or not to review MPSs. And that was all done, as, as Harry says, um, to avoid the problem one had before of policy without any kind of central control updating itself and rendering decision making defunct. Um, thanks Ned. The, the, the next question which um, uh, I, I will deal with before we come on to the point uh, that Helen Forbes has raised is from uh, Lucy um, Parfit which is um, asking whether we're aware of any cases relating to the installation of petrol or fuel stations. Um, I'll give Ned a, uh, an opportunity to display his knowledge of these cases uh, in due course, but I personally haven't come across um, any. But just reflecting on, on, on the nature of developments of that sort, that they occupy what might be seen as an intermediate position. So they're not concerned with the production, the extraction of hydrocarbons, um, that they're not directly generating the use but in a sense, it might be seen that they that they facilitate uh, the, the the use by distributing fuel to places where it's needed. But but it seems to me that inherently that that is a difficult thing to uh, attack if you're looking to control carbon emissions, because the the principal focus of policy is on seeking to um, restrict the extent to which it's necessary to use um, fuel, so shaping development in a way that minimizes car use, rather than making it difficult for people to um, access fuel when they need it. And one can see some of the practical problems that might arise if you sought to tackle cl climate change by attacking distribution, um, as opposed to limiting the need to burn the fuel in the first place. Ned, is there anything you wanted to add on that? I'm, I mean, I'm equally not aware of any cases where climate change has been an issue in petrol or fuel stations. And I think that must be for the reasons that Harry, Harry, Harry you say. Um, indeed, if you think a well-located petrol station ought to reduce the amount of driving that cars are doing, because ultimately the carbon impacts are the driving of cars. So I, I can't really see how negative carbon emissions or climate change impacts would arise from a new petrol station. Thank you. And then the last question, um, Helen Forbes asks, is there a requirement to take account of downstream greenhouse gas emissions in extraction cases, even though they're not known at the decision-making stage? And you know, that seemed to me to be um, one of the sort of core things that you were dealing with. And so I just wondered if you wanted to provide some sort of overview um, in answer to that question. I'll, I'll do my best and then I'll see if you've got anything to add, Harry, because you've done some of these cases too. Um, I mean, I think um, I would say that it's going to depend upon the facts of any given case what the extent of an assessment has to be. Where a project is uh, likely to have significant effects, it's environmental impact assessment development, um, and one has to carry out uh, an environmental impact assessment, the environmental statement must include the indirect effects to climate change, some assessment of them. The question then is how it needs to do that. Clearly, direct effects must be covered. In small cases where um, the use it just links to a, a local pipeline, the authority of the courts, and these were the cases I um, discussed earlier, 
the frac free Rydale case and Preston New Action Road Group is that you don't need to go and specifically assess those. And presumably the reasoning for that is that that, that downstream use just gets merged in with uh, impacts that would otherwise happen. It's impossible to differentiate. I think in bigger cases, it becomes more difficult to say nothing about downstream use. Um, and I think uh, certainly in the, the, the large coal cases, I think there's an expectation that that's something that's covered in environmental statements and therefore is something that should be considered by local authorities. The question then becomes a really quite a difficult one as to in considering it, what assumptions you apply and how you justify those assumptions. Um, in many cases, I would have thought it would be reasonable to apply some fairly substantial assumptions, which mean resolve the problem, Helen, that you ask about not knowing exactly what they are. You cannot know. You have to make some assumptions, set up what they are, and if they're reasonable, I would have thought you've done enough. I don't know yeah, if that I, helps. I'd agree with that, Ned. I mean, one of the, one of the difficulties that... Um, came up really I think for objectors in the wrestle inquiry that I was involved in which was uh, the, the extraction of oil and, and gas and they were primarily I think interested in the um, the oil extraction is that there, there was in that case a, a lot of local industry that used um, petrochemicals um, for the manufacture of various goods um, including medical uh, supplies actually used in the manufacture of wind turbines. And so one of the, the problems is if you make uh, a, an assumption, a sort of worst case assumption and say, well, it's going to be used um, for, I don't know, the, the, the fueling of motor cars. What do you then do with that piece of information? If you know that that might not be the case, it might be used for something uh, which is really important, say um, medical supplies, or it might be used for something which will actively help tackle climate change such as wind turbines and therefore it's very difficult to find a practical way of using information based on a worst case assessment in that sort of situation to inform decision making because the worst case assumption might not be um, what happens and how do you deal with the supply that's needed for those other functions if you refuse on the basis of a worst case assumption so one can see that uh, that, that uh, unlike perhaps in coal cases where it might be more straightforward for hydrocarbons, the multiplicity of potential end uses makes that a very difficult issue to, to um, bring into decision making. Now, I think we've um, uh, got uh, at one final point. Um, Ned, Annabelle Bridgman has um, said, Ned, you referred to uh, slightly out of date written ministerial statement from 2015 2018 on extraction. Is this the view of the court or council as to whether those are um, slightly out of date? I think that's a sort of factual question, Ned, related to one of the things you were dealing with yeah. um, in your talk. I think it would be unsafe to treat that as either the view of council or of, or of the court. It certainly doesn't come from any, any court authority. Um, all I was all I was talking about is simply the factual circumstance that the 2015 written ministerial statement had been somewhat superseded by the MPPF coming in and then the Stevenson challenge. Um, I, I think more recent statements are probably where one should be looking first rather than going back to the 2015 statement, but it's, it's, it's still there. Ed, thank you very much for that. Um, that brings us to uh, the end of the question and answer session uh, and to our presentation. Thank you all for watching. We hope you've found it useful. Um, now, as many of you will know, this is one of a series of uh, webinars that Chambers is putting on during the lockdown uh, period. And please do see our um, website for details of forthcoming events and how to sign up for them. Um, as I indicated at the start, you'll all be getting an email with a copy of the slides and a link to uh, the Chamber's YouTube channel, a phrase I never thought I'd heard myself uh, uh, say, but uh, uh, it, it's been a great innovation as a result of um, having to do everything virtually. So I hope that um, you, you make use of that.
and uh, uh, I hope we will see you at some of our future events. So thank you, Ned, uh, and thank you all. Thanks, Harry. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye-bye.